Hey guys, I'm Ronella Hernandez with Webfree TV and I'm at ETH CC in Paris. Joining me here, we have a Robbie Young, the CEO of Animoca Brands. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for joining me. I wanted to learn just about how your experience is going here at ECC. I know you've also been doing the conference circuit last week or in Portugal. So tell me a little bit about that and why it's important to have a presence at these large scale events. Sure. I think for us, being here at ECC is really important because actually we have um, we have many studios that we make games from around the world. Um, we just happen to have three studios here in France, uh, two of which are in Paris. Um, but more importantly, I think it's because the Web3 community here in France is particularly strong and robust. So I find, you know, events coming to Paris is a great way for people to organize and all convene in one place. I think Paris has a tremendous ecosystem of Web3 companies um, that help you know, support the developer community and really attract people to events here. So we wouldn't miss it. Definitely. And what about in the gaming world? Do you, would you consider Paris to be a gaming hub? Uh, I would consider, I, I consider France to be a gaming hub, um, not necessarily Paris specifically. Um, for example, our uh, studio Eden Games, which is in Lyon, um, actually Lyon is kind of a hub for people who make racing games and that's what Eden does. So many of the greatest racing games that you know and love are all made by different studios in Lyon. Um, and, uh, and yes, in different pockets of France. Um, but I think gaming particularly, you'll always find that um, there are great ecosystems of game studios in countries and, and municipalities that offer encouraging incentives for game companies to be there because like all creative industries, we can benefit from government incentives to encourage us to take risks. Okay, could you maybe talk a little bit more about that and some examples of those incentives? Sure, so for example, uh, in the UK, or in um, you know Catalonia in Spain, for example, there are tax incentives, and most famously Canada too. There are tax incentives where you know you will get some of your payroll taxes back or things like that if you are in certain creative industries. And this was pioneered by the film industry, but extends now to the game industry as well. And what it means is that for us as game developers, we can take a risk on a new commercial project, which you know may fail because many creative products don't succeed always. And so it allows us to be able to afford to take that risk because the government is also encouraging us to do so. Okay, I see. And then what about Fran Mocha Brands then? Are there any priorities that you guys have right now given the current market when it comes to investments? Um, t tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. I think for us, the only thing that's really sort of changed um, during this investment climate over the last year or so has been, I guess, the speed and the type of investments that we invest in. So obviously the pace has slowed down. Um, you know, it is an investor friendly market, so we can afford to take our time. Um, and I think that we can also afford to be more choosy. And so what this results in is we're tending to invest in projects that are slightly more mature. Um, they may already have some kind of MVP. They may already have, you know, a little bit of product market fit. Um, and I think for things that are more concept stage, we're passing on those, honestly, and we're suggesting to people that they need to have a little bit of traction um, or a little, you know, demo of a product, etc., before we'll come in, even though we are an early stage investor. Okay, I see. And then are there any like requirements or something that you specifically look for? You said there's maturity, but are there any, maybe, I don't know if you can give examples, but just the types of companies um, that Animoca would want to represent? Sure, I think um, ideally it would be something where we can, like investors always tend to look at things very simplistically. They want to find a company that's perfect and all they need is money and then <laughs> they will, you know, the, the business will do amazingly, yeah. right? That's the ideal investor scenario. So I think from our perspective, we're always looking for companies where they already have most of the boxes ticked, but for the ones that they don't have, those are areas that we can actually add value and help them with. That's the that's the part where we're actually a strategic investor. So if they have an incredible game, for example, and they're 
you know, pretty much done with development, but they need to fix their tokenomics because they can't quite get it right and they don't have the skill sets internally to do that because this might be their first blockchain game. Right. That's an area where I have a tokenomics team, I have an engineering team, I can help them um, to tweak the product and make it successful. And so we can then partner together on that. And so that makes a, a very, you know, obvious use case for investment for us. Okay. And then what are maybe some of the challenges that you see the most? Like when companies do come to you, is it topic tokenomics that they need the most help with, or what? What? What do you think is is the most um, important issue? So for game companies, it's usually two problems. One is um, navigating technical infrastructure um, that is not that is part of integrating Web3 Rails into a game. And so um, there's lots of things involved with, um, you know, blockchain engineering and middleware and yeah. fiat on ramps and all that kind of stuff. So navigating that ecosystem of partners or whether they want to build stuff themselves. Um, and then tokenomics would be the other one because actually just designing a game economy, building open is very, very different. And I think the biggest mistake you can make is trying to build the economy using the same mindset that you would use for a closed hyperinflationary economy, which are traditional game economies. Um, and the problem is that it won't be sustainable if you build it that way. Right, because it's dependent on users, right? It's dependent on users. And and I think that, you know, you need to work with a team. Obviously, we have one, but there are great teams out there. Horizon, Bitcraft, they all provide tokenomics support and advice and help people to understand how to build sustainable economies. Um, and very often, you know, ironically, we find that it's not even um, economists uh, who are the main people who work on these projects, right. but actually, um, actually physicists. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so material physicists um, really like they understand how to build highly complex systems. And that's essentially what we have with tokenomics. And that can also be applied, I guess, to metaverse economies as well, exactly. which I think need a lot of development right now <laughs> would you agree <laughs> yes yes completely well and and we make games so we view metaverse as basically an extension of building a game it's a particular genre of game if you will okay. but the idea that you can have a big essentially open world environment where um, you can't control everything you know it has a life of its own and so you need to give it the tools to be sustainable and self-perpetuating right. and the important thing is sustainability and longevity that's more important than you know revenue goals or user goals or other things because if you build for those goals ultimately it will spiral out of control and it won't be sustainable yeah i think people realize that now recently mm -hmm. after the bull market when people were just throwing money at the chance of being in the metaverse now it's like okay but wait no we actually have to like build something sustainable that makes people want to come into these platforms so what would you say are some of the the main use cases that you think metaverse platforms should be used for so i think <clears throat> By their nature, metaverse platforms are gathering places for communities. So the question is, what kind of content can can be the glue, the stickiness to bring that community together? Some of it can be purely social. You know, for example, live event spaces are fantastic. People love to collaborate or to to congregate, I should say, from time to time for live events, whether it's watching a movie online together or chatting or you know listening to music, etc., um, having a game night. That kind of collaboration is great. Um, I've seen great uh, e-commerce shopping applications where people congregate for periodic sales online. I think there's been a lot of focus on building metaverse shopping malls. Right. But the different difficult part with shopping malls, as anybody who has built a physical shopping mall will tell you, is how do you get the foot traffic in, right? Um, and so as a result, sometimes when you create events around shopping and they're of limited duration, for example, mm -hmm. it creates excitement. I mean, right. think of Amazon Prime Day or you know Alibaba Day, etc. Yeah, well, I, in Decentraland, they had the, the Metaverse Fashion Week, but the numbers compared this year compared to last year were just not there because I guess people, that hype has is gone now. So people might not see, not, might not be as excited about it anymore. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, th I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's that last year there was a lot more, there were a lot more people coming out of curiosity, whereas right. at the moment in this market, because we lose that, that additional hype layer, um, you basically have people who are really dedicated fans. And so I think one of the things that I've observed over the last year is that 
the revenues that companies are earning from their customers and their users and communities are much more real sticky revenues because these are the players and the payers mm. who love the applications. They're the core community and people just need to lean into their core communities who are the supporters of their projects because these are the people who, thick or thin, are with you because they love what you do. And so then that's the base upon which you build on top of. Okay, I love that. So that's a positive view, I guess, on the landscape right now. <laughs> okay, good, good. And then what advice maybe would you give to founders or, or developers that are looking to be in this space and, and are looking to come in at a time like this? Sure. Um, I think the advice I always give to people who have zero experience and have just heard about it is, um, you know, open up a wallet, <laughs> buy some stuff, try it, yeah. right? You need to be a customer first. Yeah. Um, and, and because I think a lot of the benefits of ownership and digital ownership in software is something that's very difficult to appreciate um, until you've really done it for the first time. It's a little bit like owning a home, right? If you've rented a flat your entire life, you don't actually understand the meaning of ownership until you do it. And you, it's difficult to explain. You can understand it cognitively, but once you own it and you stop paying rent every month, you're like, wow, that's, it's, it's a different feeling, mm. right? And, and I think we find that with digital assets as well. So trial and error. <laughs> yes, okay. absolutely. And can you share any upcoming announcements from Animoca Brands? Maybe you can share with us. <laughs> so I, 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 while I wouldn't share upcoming announcements that are confidential, I think I'm most excited. Actually, we were just chatting because we're here at ETCC. So we have an event tomorrow night that's at the Sandbox offices, uh, which we're doing together with the Sandbox and Life Beyond Studios, which are our two studios here in Paris. Um, I would encourage people, Sandbox season four, opening soon mm -hmm. so definitely come to the sandbox and check it out if you haven't before and then uh, life beyond which is of course really i think one of the first true triple a games um, built on blockchain please come and check it out it's in open alpha now and i think if you want to see what kind of really photorealistic immersive traditional game experiences can be built using blockchain it's a great example i look forward to that event um, but i did want to ask about uh, the sandbox on that topic I know that maybe their revenue and their numbers might not be as strong as they were before. So I did want to know if how they're facing that or if they have any, yeah, how, how basically how they're dealing with low usership. Mm, <laughs> maybe you've heard something I haven't heard. Um, <clears throat> so I think number one, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it low usership, okay. um, but I would say like all Web3 products, right? Um, we cater ultimately to a core Web3 community. While we aspire to onboard users from outside the Web3 ecosystem, the reality is our core user base are native Web3 users. And that grows slowly as mm. consumer brands come in the space and um, sports brands and other things that appeal to a much broader audience outside of Web3, they might come in through those gateways. Um, but I think ultimately within the Web3 community, the metric of success of projects actually needs to be defined mm. by something very traditional, which is revenues. Do you make money? Does the business pay the bills, right? Because the difference we have in Web3 is that user retention is much, much higher and average revenue per user is much, much higher. So even in the game industry, I, I really can't compare Web3 games to Web2 games mm. because I'll give you an example. <clears throat> in a Web2 mobile game, you would be happy with two to four cents per user per month as a revenue number, okay. right? Whereas in a Web3 game, you're getting hundreds of dollars a month often from a user. Okay. And so how do you compare two cents to hundreds of dollars? It's like night and day. And, and so by the same token, in a Web2 mobile game, I would want to have 10 million downloads in the first week because otherwise I'm going to lose my shirt because of those 10 million downloads, only 2% of the users are going to pay me and I'm only going to get six cents a user, I see. right? Whereas in a Web3 game, if every user is spending 500 bucks a month, if I have 5,000 users, that's okay, right? So is that on, is that mostly on like mm, skins and Perhaps. I don't know, tools or equipment or whatever is needed in the game? Okay. Yeah, it's usually divided between like customizations where you want to personalize things right. and also things that can help enhance play. Oh, okay. 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 Oh, I see. I didn't, I hadn't thought about that, that distinction. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. 
and enjoy the rest of the conference. No problem. Thank you. It was great to see you.